The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. So as I mentioned, we are concluding the book of Titus this evening. We'll be in Titus chapter 3, verse 12 in just a few moments. And in some ways, it saddens me to come to the end of this book because it is such a a wonderful book. It is so practical, so relevant for the church, um, so instructive, I think, for us in our Christian life and how we're supposed to be living in this place with one another. Um, I love the emphasis on discipleship that Titus chapter 2 places. I love how in Titus chapter 1, we get this clear picture of what leadership is supposed to look like. And why it's so important that there's going to be attacks on the church. There's going to be false teachers. And I've loved this third chapter of Titus where he just makes the gospel so plain and he shows how because of the gospel, we ought to live godly, righteous lives. That the gospel ought to change everything about us. And so it saddens me in a way to come to the end, um, but I've enjoyed the journey. But as we come to this last few verses, I think when we read them, you'll find that they seem rather ordinary. If you were here a few weeks back when Pastor Dressler preached the last message on the book of 2 Corinthians, it seems there like it's just this incredible passage, this glorious ending to a great book. And then I looked at the last few verses of Titus, and I was like, Paul, couldn't you have been a little more eloquent like you were here in in 2 Corinthians here in Titus? But it really seems like he's just given, you know, last few thoughts and a few comments. And in we might run the risk of thinking, well, these verses are probably mostly relevant for Titus. It's likely that Paul was just concluding this with a few ideas for Titus that really aren't that relevant for us. And in fact, if we weren't as a church committed to the whole Bible as the counsel of God, that every passage is inspired and infallible, that all of it is for our good and that it's all important for us, if we were committed to that, I don't think you would randomly say, okay, well, i got to pick a text tonight. Which text am I? I'm going to go to the end of the book of Titus. I feel like you probably never get there. But because we're committed to that truth, that the Bible is the word of God, that the whole counsel of God is important, that all of it is necessary for our good and, and our building up into the image of Christ, because we believe that, we, we do expositional preaching, where we pe- preach through the Bible, passage at a time, passage at a time. And so we come to the end of this book and we say, well, it seems rather ordinary, but there must be something there for us. God must be trying to say something to us today. I think in this case, there is beauty in what seems ordinary at first glance. And so I hope tonight you'll be able to see that beauty. I believe that in this text, we'll see how God is at work in the ordinary And maybe, if we get this, we'll have a clearer vision of how God works in our ordinary as well. Because if we're honest, we're all fairly ordinary, aren't we? We are. There's not a whole lot of extraordinary people sitting in this room, um, or standing in this room. Um, We're we're just normal people, and I, I love how we look at this, and we see just God working through what seems like ordinary people in an ordinary letter. And just, it's just wonderful how God works. And so open to Titus chapter 3, verse 12. These are the final words of the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Titus, at least the final words of this letter. We imagine that Paul's final request for Titus to come visit him, it, that it worked out and that they were able to have some time together there. But this is the last thing he had to say for Titus as he instructed this church. So I'll read the passage, and then we'll go back and do some digging. Titus chapter 3, verse 12 to 15 says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me, unto Nicopolis. For I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they may be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee, Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. We see here there are three commands and then a greeting. Paul tells Titus what to do when Artemis and Tychicus arrive. Paul tells Titus what to do with Zenus and Apollos. Paul tells Titus what to teach the people so that they're not unfruitful. And then he gives a final greeting or a final farewell. 
to the folks there. Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Let's get into this, because I think you read those verses, and, and I don't know about you, but when I first read it, I thought, so what? <laughs> well, so what do I do with that? But as I studied it, I, I thought, there, there is a lot here. And so Titus chapter 3, verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined to winter there. Paul informs Titus that he will soon be replaced by two men, Artemis and Tychicus. We know of Tychicus, if you know the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20, Tychicus is one of Paul's traveling companions. In the letter um, that was written to the church of Ephesus, it seems like Tychicus was the person delivering that letter. And so this is what Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus about Tychicus. He said, Tychicus a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. So there, he's sending Tychicus. He's saying that he's a beloved brother and a faithful minister. In other words, respect him and listen to him. He's going to have good things to say. He's going to inform you about what we've been doing. So in, in a sense, Paul is reporting to the church of Ephesus through Tychicus of his own ministry. And then he finishes with, he will come and he will comfort your hearts. And so Tychicus, I mean, he seems like a very godly man who is um, trusted by Paul to deliver this important message and that Paul is commending to this church. We see almost the exact same wording written to the the church of Colossae. And that makes sense because Ephesians and Colossians were both prison epistles and Paul must have sent both of them at the same time, likely by the messenger Tychicus. And so we have Tychicus, who seems like a Paul's son of the faith, traveling companion, trusted fellow laborer. And I think often we think of like Paul's sons in the faith. Who comes to mind first? Well, Timothy probably, and Titus. But when we look at everything else, other than the fact that Tychicus doesn't get his own book, Tychicus is right up there. Right? I mean, he's, he's just another person that Paul has been discipling. And so pretty neat that he's there. And then we have Artemis. And Artemis is nobody. I mean, it really isn't. He's nobody. There's no other mention of Artemis anywhere in the scripture. So we know absolutely nothing about Artemis other than the fact that Paul is saying, I will send Tychicus or Artemis. Either one of, the, either one of these men are going to come and they're going to replace you. Paul is requesting that Titus joins him in Nicopolis for the winter. Nicopolis is a beautiful city in Greece. The word opolis means city, and the word Nike is victory, and so it's the the city of victory. It's a beautiful place. And Paul is about to settle in for the winter, where it's more difficult to travel, and it kind of makes sense. He chooses a place like Nicopolis. And here he sends a message to Titus, and he says, hey, I'm going to send these guys pretty soon to you, and I want you to join me. I want to have you here with me. I want to spend the winter with you. I want us to be able to talk and, and to spend time together. I really like how this is, I mean, sometimes I think we think everything Paul does was just like, he's always breaking into prisons. And certainly that happened, right? But that's not always what was happening with Apostle Paul. Sometimes he was just going to a place in Nicopolis for the winter and trying to get a couple guys to spend that winter with. that, That Likely he would still disciple and he would teach and they would minister there, I'm sure. But it seemed like Paul is just, hey, I've got nothing I have to do right now. Let's go to Nicopolis. We'll do ministry there together. We'll spend time together. Why? Was it because Paul had something important to tell him? Doesn't seem like it. Was it because Paul had a new mission? That's not mentioned. Was there a big conference there that every Christian needed to go to? No. It's because Paul wants to spend some time with his son in the faith, Titus, in a beautiful city over the winter. And it just reminds me of the verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. Paul is speaking about his own life, and he says... I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Do you know what these verses here in Titus they remind me of? I see at this point in Paul's life, it seems like maybe he's getting this quiet reprieve in Nicopolis for the winter. And Paul has just been in prison, right? He's already gone to prison in Acts chapter 28 to Rome. And so that was like more the house arrest version of prison. And in a couple of years from now, he'll be brought back to that prison, this time not in house arrest, but in like the, the 
dark part of the prison, and eventually he'll be killed for his faith. And he seems like he has about two years off here, where he goes around, he ministers, and he spends a winter in Nicopolis. And here Paul is abounding, but he knows how to be abased. He knows how to suffer, he knows how to be... And do you know what all of this reminds me of? That for Paul... He was, he was not going after suffering. He was not going after the extraordinary. He was willing to just go wherever. He was willing to suffer if that's what was necessary. And he was willing to go to Nicopolis if, that, if that's what worked out. I think sometimes when, in our lives, we think, if I'm comfortable, then clearly I'm not in God's will. Well, that might be true. It might be true if God has told you that you need to sacrifice something, and you've said no, and you're holding on to your comfort over those other things. And what's wonderful here is Paul didn't hold on to his comfort, but at times it seems like God allowed him to abound. He gave him these these gifts, and God is the giver of all good gifts. And so if we will just trust him and follow him, then we'll find that sometimes it costs a lot, and sometimes we get a nice rest. Sometimes we get to enjoy friends. You know, it's, it's not... Giving your life to the Lord is not all bad. It's not bad at all, right? But the, the first thought that comes to everybody's mind is, well, I'm going to have to be a missionary in Africa if I give my life to the Lord. Or I'm going to have to give... You should be willing to be a missionary in Africa. I mean, if, if God opens those doors and leads you in that direction and, and burdens you with that, then be willing. But God is your Father, and He loves you. And he'll give you times where you get to sit with Titus and Nicopolis, and he'll give you times where he says, and you're going to be in prison for a bit. I mean, maybe not literally, but maybe, right? We ought to trust God, follow him, and see how it works. I just, when I saw that, I thought, that's, that's really ordinary, but I think it's nice to see that in Paul's life. Verse 13, bring Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting to them. So now we're introduced to two more characters, Zenus, the lawyer, he is the lawyer in the Bible that is well spoken of. Um, there's other lawyers in the Bible that tempt Christ that aren't well spoken of, but here we have Zenus, who is a good, faithful minister of the gospel, and he's saying when Zenus the lawyer comes and Apollos, um, th- make sure that there's nothing wanting. Help them, bring them. The word bring there is bring forth, escort, or aid. So he's saying when, when they come, help them escort them, aid them, make sure that there's nothing wanting. Anything that they need, provide for them. And this is the picture of what working together in the kingdom should be like. Here is Titus, who has his hands full with the church, who's in the middle of this sinful island of Crete, and he's got people, he's trying to, to figure out who is going to be the elders, and who's going to be discipling, and who's going to um, be able to stand against these false teachers. And then Paul says, well, there's these two guys who have a ministry going on, you need to help them. Take t- like That's worth stopping what you're doing for a moment to give what you have to help these people on their journey. Okay, Zenus, again, we know nothing else about. Apollos is a, is a great orator. He's, he's a wonderful, eloquent speaker. Before he, was, he even understood the gospel, it said that he knew the Old Testament scriptures very well, and he spoke of them very well. Aquila and Priscilla take him aside. They show him the gospel. He becomes a great minister of the gospel. And so great, in fact, that he's compared with Peter, Paul, and Jesus in the church of Corinth. So they thought highly of him. And again, we have this Zenus who is nobody, and Apollos who is this pretty well-known preacher, traveling preacher. And he says, these two guys, help them, escort them, aid them, um, give them what they need, take a collection, send them with snacks, clothing, transportation, give them food to eat and a bed to sleep in, be company, be encouraging. Do all the things that, that they would need to help them on their journey. This is what we should be doing for fellow believers. Verse number 14. Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. O Titus, and here's one last word for our brothers and sisters in Crete. And we're speaking about these missionaries that are going to come and these others that are going to be here in a little while. Make sure that you're telling our people that they learn to maintain good works, which I think is clear. It's been clear throughout the letter and clear throughout the New Testament that believers ought to maintain good works. But here he gives a little bit of a reason for it, for necessary uses. And what that's talking about is 
for urgent needs. So when something comes up, make sure they're already in the habit of maintaining good work so that when the need comes up, they'll be there to meet it. I love this thought because most of us would think, like we, we always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, don't we? So if I'm, gonna, if I'm thinking about a situation and I'm telling you, okay, well, in this situation, let's, let's pretend you're in a, uh, what do you, before you get a job, what's that called, an interview, and the interviewer says, well, in this situation, what would you do? Are you going to tell them, like, I would do the worst thing possible? Probably not. Like, uh, if a customer comes in and they're not satisfied with their milkshake, I'm going to um, take their milkshake and dump it over their head. You're probably not going to say that. You might want to do that. <laughs> Well, you're probably not going to do that. You're, like, you're going to give yourself a benefit of the doubt. I'd be really nice, and I, right? And so here, what he's saying is, it's not good enough just to think that when an opportunity arises, you're going to help people. What he's saying is, there should be a pattern already present in your life of good works, so that when a necessary use comes up, you're ready. You're not going to be unfruitful. And the implication is, if you're not already maintaining good works, then when a necessary use comes up, when, it, when a need is there in front of you, you will be unfruitful. You're not going to be meeting needs. I love this thought because it made me think of Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And we went through this with our teens a few weeks ago. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Okay, now I immediately read that and you're like, oh, I don't know how those are connected. This is, how I see, this is where I see the connection. What Paul is saying to the Galatian church is that you need to be spiritual so that when those who are fallen, they're overtaken in a fault, they're struggling, they have a weight that they can't bear. When those people are there, you're able to help them. Do you know what he says to people who aren't spiritual? He says nothing. Because they're no good. I mean, they're, they're no good to that person. They're, no, they're of no help, no value. If, if you think that you're going to be any benefit to this church or to any other brothers and sisters in Christ, but you're not, you might think, yeah, but I'm not as bad as this person. I'm not fallen. I'm not the one who's overtaken in a fault. If you're not spiritual, growing, maturing, trying to be in the word, being serious about your faith, then when anybody ever needs help, there is nothing for you to do. And here in this case, if you're not already maintaining good works, you're not already trying to, to live out your faith, when a necessary use comes up, you're of no value. And so, brothers and sisters, we might not see the need right in front of us at this moment. And you might say, someday I want to be used by God. I want God to allow me to help somebody. I want God to allow me to make a difference in someone's life. If you're not doing, if you're not in a relationship with God, if you're not being faithful in the mundane, in the ordinary, then you're going to be of no value when that opportunity comes. When the brother falls, or when missionaries come and they need help, or whatever the situation is. So we need to make sure that we're being prepared to be used by God. And if we think of every day of our life a preparation for God to use us in the future, that'd be, I think that would be really helpful. I think that, that all of a sudden a need would come up and we'd be the ones that could step up and meet it. So, don't just give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Try and, try and be different. Try and live spiritually. Verse number 15. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be to you all. Amen. There is a joy of receiving a greeting that is sent from another to you. If you've ever had a friend and, and that friend visited someone and, and when they came back, they said, hey, listen, I, I talked to this person. They really wanted me to, to tell you that they miss you and they love you and that they wanted to just send a greeting. That's meaningful, isn't it? That they've taken the time to mention your name and to send this greeting with this other person. And so what Paul begins, he says, all that are with me, salute thee. I want you to know, um, Titus, that all of our brothers and sisters here, all of our fellow laborers that are here with me right now, they want to say hi to you. I mean, they, they miss you. They love you. They're praying for you. I, all that is, I think, encapsulated in this idea of they're saluting you. They're thinking about you, right? You're important to them. And so that, I think, would encourage Titus's heart. He goes on, he says, greet them that love us in the faith. And not only do these brothers and sisters salute you, but I want you to take this greeting and give it to all the brothers and sisters that are there. 
that are in Crete. And again, that would be so encouraging to them that Titus can hold this up and say, listen, I want you to know Paul loves you and he's thinking about you and you know who you are. Those that love him, you know that you have this relationship with them. He wants you to know he's still thinking about you. He loves you. Right? That's, I mean, it's encouraging. It's great to see believers encouraging other believers. Um, I mentioned, I think in Sunday school, that there'd be, there's been many people that have encouraged me and, and tried to help while the pastor has been gone. And it really has been an encouraging thing. And somebody came up tonight and said, I just want to encourage you one more time. Is that okay? It's always okay. <laughs> okay? I'll take it. <laughs> um, pastor says, and he's, he said before, that he's never thought he needed it. And then I think on a couple Sunday nights ago he said, but sometimes it really helps. And it's true. And I, I think I've realized early on that though I want to think I don't need it, I do. We all do. So be encouraging to other people. Show your love to them. Uh, don't, I mean, this is, this is coming from a guy who's terrible at it. It's not a good idea to just hide your emotions and your feelings and, and assume that everybody already knows how you feel. Sometimes you've got to say it. And sometimes I've got to say it. So, uh, grace be with you all. Paul ends with grace, as per usual, because it's all about grace. And that's the conclusion of this book. So I have a few thoughts before we conclude that I want you to ponder. First one is, notice that everyone is replaceable in the work of the Lord. Everyone is replaceable in the work of the Lord. If you think about Titus reading this letter for the first time, oh, by the way, all of this that I've just told you, and the fact that I sent you there and I gave you this incredible job, this responsibility, that you're going to go to the island of Crete, you're going to set up elders, you're going to teach them all these things, you're going to show them how to disciple, you're going to show them what it means to live out the gospel. This is going to be your people, your churches to set up. Oh, by the way, um, Artemis or Tychicus is going to take over pretty soon. So I want, just, just be ready to leave at any moment's notice because you might not ne- be needed a week from now. That's, that's essentially what he's saying. <laughs> and I thought Titus would be Paul, these people really need me, but they don't. Now, we like to believe that they do, and they say that one of the best ways to have job security is to make people around you believe that you're essential to the company, that your work is important, that nobody else can do it, right? If if people believe that, then they won't fire you, they won't get rid of you. In the work of the Lord, everyone is replaceable. Everyone. Because it's not our work. It's the Lord's work. It's not our power. It's the Lord's power. It's not our church. It's the Lord's church. Right? None of this is ours. And God can do what he's going to do any way that he wants to do it. And if he wants to to bring a revival through one um, great preacher, one personality, he can do that if he chooses to. But he can can also do it through just a number of small prayer groups getting together and, and a prayer meeting growing where there doesn't seem to be any real centerpiece preacher but there's just a lot of people getting together to love the Lord because God can do what he wants to do any way he wants to do it. And Titus here is very replaceable. I thought about the New Testament, how you have Jesus spending time with, like, primarily 12 men, right? He didn't pour his life into thousands of people, though he taught thousands of people. He poured his life into 12 men. And, all, and right away you have one of them knocked off because you got Judas gone, right? And then, out of those 12 men, he took three of them. And he spent even more time with those three, Peter, James, and John. So you have Peter and then the Sons of Thunder. And then what happens? Acts chapter 12, it comes like almost out of nowhere. Acts chapter 12, verse 1, says, Now about this time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Period. What? I mean, three people that Jesus, more than anybody else, poured his life in, and just Herod decides to kill someone. He cuts off James' head. He's gone, and now he's maybe going to kill Peter. That's, that's Acts chapter 12. James, the apostle who spent so much time with Jesus, was replaceable. Don't tell me God couldn't have protected him if he wanted to. That was part of, I mean, God was okay with that. God allowed that to happen. And so, I mean, he did protect Peter. He had more for Peter to do, but James is gone. Because James is replaceable, everyone is replaceable. Uh, There's a man named Pastor Boffman, who was my previous pastor's father-in-law. So Pastor Doug Wood's father-in-law. 
And I didn't know him very well because he kind of died when I was very early and starting to come to the church. But I, what I knew of him was great. I know Tara knows a little bit more of him and said that he was just a great man. I don't think there's many people you talk to that don't have many, many good things to say about Pastor Boffman. The one thing I remember him saying is that if you can leave a church and not, and leave, and not leave a hole in the ministry there, then you've wasted your time. So if you're able to step out of the church and nobody really, like, there's no, like, oh, no, now we have these holes that we have to fill because these people have been serving and, and helping and that they're, they're so important in, in this ministry. If you, can, if you leave and there's no hole, then you've really been wasting your time. So that should make you think about, okay, if I left today, would there be a hole, right? But having said that, every hole can be filled. So we should be serving it and putting ourselves out there but we've seen it before where wonderful, godly people leave this church. And we think, how are we going to go on in this ministry? How are we going to go on in our music? How are we going to go on in whatever it is? And, and then God uses others to step up. And, and we see that just the church goes on. It does. Everybody is replaceable. And this is not a bad thing. This is a wonderful thing. This reminds us who it's all about and what it's all about. And it's God's church. The church of Crete, without Titus, would do just fine. Why? Because God was sending Tychicus or Artemis to help, and that's what they needed. The second thought that I had, so everybody's replaceable, the second one is everyone is useful in the work of the Lord. So yes, we're replaceable, and I hope that doesn't make you feel sad. It's true. But we're also useful. Here we have an interesting cast of characters. We have Paul's son in the faith, Titus, who was the center of controversy in Acts chapter 15, who was a traveling church fixer. He went to Corinth when Corinth was having problems. Now he's in Crete because Crete's having problems. He's just the guy that Paul trusts to go to places to fix problems. Even when Timothy fails, Titus is there. He'll do it. Just a wonderful example of a godly young man. Then you have Artemis, who is nothing. No, nothing about him. Then you have Tychicus, who is another godly character who is, who's listed as his traveling companion, who has gone to at least Ephesus and Colossae, and, and he delivered the book of, possibly the book of Philemon. Um, so he, here's Tychicus, and wonderful godly man. Then the next person is Zenos. We don't know anything about Zenos. Then you have Apollos, who's this great orator. We have this cast of characters, and it reminds us that the the Bible, the, the work of the Lord, that it's not being done by just one man. And, and it's not just that the characters that we read about are the people that God was using to build his church and no one else. And I think sometimes we read about Peter's life, we read about Paul's life, and we see that the focus in the book of Acts is the life of Peter and Paul, and then we see all these letters written by Paul, and we see certain characters that get n- named often, and we think, well, those must have been the ones that were doing all the work in the early church. I'll tell you something, that is not at all true. There are so many names in the New Testament that, that, we, that are mentioned that were incredibly godly fellow servants. When I say Artemis and Zenos are nothing, what I mean is we know nothing about them, but very likely they're just as good as Apollos and Tychicus and, 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 and Titus and Timothy and, and others that we know more about. And I'm sure there are thousands of others who weren't named here aren't named anywhere, but we're wonderful servants of the Lord. Why? Because everybody is useful. So don't think about the ministry of the New Testament in the early church as what Paul did. All of that is what God did. And he used the apostle Paul because he recognized his weakness and God's strength in his weakness, but he used many, many other brothers and sisters to build his church. And what I'm getting at here is it's, it's not just guys like Paul are useful. You're useful. Your gifts are useful. Your gifts are needed. The Spirit works through normal people. Uh, Brother Dennis Floyd gave his testimony yesterday at the men's breakfast. And one of the neat things about his testimony is that he mentioned that um, he had a neighbor that was just a normal neighbor, but a godly example, invited him to church. And by the time that this neighbor was out, really, the family hadn't changed. They probably moved and thought, yeah, there was very little impact on that house. And, and what ended up happening is because of their testimony and their influence on his life, Dennis got saved, eventually his parents got saved, and, and now we have 
at least one. I was, I was hoping because usually the other boys are here too. But we have one son sitting here um, in, in the church trying to um, raise his family to love the Lord. And, and both, his other, both his other boys are trying to do the same thing. Jared's not married yet. But that's, I mean, the point is that just these little ordinary things. Now, that's not ever going to be written in a book, right? You're never going to write in a book, well, Dennis Floyd had a neighbor that invited him to church and was a godly example. When he went to his house, he just noticed something different. That, but that happens. That's, I mean, uh, my family started coming to church because we got invited by a neighbor. And that neighbor wasn't even that serious about the church. They just invited us out. Um, so God works through ordinary people, ordinary events, so many people were not thinking, to build his kingdom. Is his church. And so here we have just a sampling of a couple people that he used, some who seem very important and some who we know nothing about. Number three, everything is ordinary until God steps in. These travel plans seem ordinary, boring almost. It occurred to me that much of Titus's life was ordinary. I think at times his life was mundane. At times it was difficult. And when I say difficult, I don't just mean the cool kind of difficult where you're being persecuted and somebody's going to write about it. I mean the kind of difficult, like, it's been weeks and months and nobody seems to be changing in the church. I'm struggling along and, and ministry is hard and just the, the normal difficulty that anybody who is a minister knows about. And I'm not saying that ministers are, are the ones that they go through the most difficulty. It, everybody goes through difficulty in their life. Everybody's life is at times ordinary and mundane and and. All of us at times might ask the question, God, are you really working through my life? Are you really working in this situation? Is anything that I'm doing of any benefit? We ask questions like that. We should. It's okay to. But here we see that everything is ordinary until God steps in. And the point is, if we're obeying God, if we're trying to do what's right, then even though our faithfulness might seem, I don't know, unfruitful for a time, God is at work. He works through our faithfulness, and he works through the ordinary. I think of so many mothers that are at home, and they're raising their kids, and it just feels mundane. You're changing diapers, and you're changing more diapers, and you're making food, and you try and clean up the house, and then the kids mess it up again, and then you try and clean up the house, and they try and make dinner, and then your husband comes home, and he messes the house up, and, and then you have more diapers to change. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, all of us go through difficult times, and sometimes the difficulty isn't a huge trauma. Sometimes the difficulty is just the normalcy of the difficulty of life. But if we're faithful in those times, then God works through those times. Not all of Titus's life was phenomenal. Not all of it was noteworthy. Not all of it would, would fill a book. And yet, God worked. <clears throat> David the shepherd, the day before Samuel showed up at Jesse's house to meet all his sons, pretty normal, pretty mundane. He was a shepherd boy. Elisha was a farmer who worked in the field when Elijah showed up. A normal farmer, right? Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, I wonder what their lives were like before they were hauled away, before they were put in a situation where they had to make a choice of what to eat, and where they, they were just under all of this spotlight and stress. The lives of these people are just ordinary. Abraham, before God called him Abraham, was just just Abraham. Ur. Ur of the Chaldees. Who wants to be from there? God works through ordinary people. And so think of your life. And think about the fact that at times it's ordinary mundane. And then remind yourself that God works through the ordinary. He works through the ordinary in the Bible. He works through the ordinary so often in our own lives. When we look back, we see that those ordinary times, God did amazing things. The book of Titus is an incredible book when it comes to how the church should function. It's an incredible book to, to understand how it should be set up. It's, it's an amazing book to help us understand how discipleship is supposed to work and it's a, just a great book to remind us of everyday Christian living. What does it mean to live out the gospel every day? I'm going to tell you something. Living out the gospel every day, it's not remarkable. It's not flashy. Living out the gospel every day is just faithfulness. There are so many people that I've seen come to this church, and I've thought, 
we could really use them. You know what happens? They fizzle out, or they're gone, or there's... And then there are other people that come to this church, and in all honesty, I think, what are they going to do? And they're faithful. And God uses them in, in wonderful ways. You see, our faithfulness, just being faithful in the normal, that's what it's about. So I'm, I love this book. I, I'm glad we got to study it. It's 7 p.m. on the dot, and so we'll close with prayer. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this wonderful book that reminds us um, that we are not needed in the kingdom, that we are very replaceable, that this is your work and you can do whatever you want through whom you like. But Lord, that you use people who are ordinary. You use people who are willing to be faithful. And you work through even some ordinary circumstances in our lives to do incredible things. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to prepare ourselves to be used by you. That rather than being the person who thinks in our mind that we are going to step up and do something amazing someday, we would just be the people who are willing to be faithful and to do good each day so that when a necessary use comes up, we're ready to help. Lord, I pray that we'd be willing to help people on their journey when um, we have friends and missionaries and other believers that come, that we do what we can to help them. God, I pray that you would just use this letter to help us better understand what you expect from believers living out the gospel. Thank you, God. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.